I believe in God. Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church. The communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. I don't know about you, but that video has been one of my favorite parts over the last 10 weeks, um, getting to see these kids. And I especially want to thank Stuart Gardner, who's on staff here at our church, for taking the time out each week uh, to do that. So, and for all the kids, like Mickey, you're famous now. There's so many famous kids <laughs> in our church. So I just want to start off by asking, how many of you are fans of the National Lampoon's movies, like Vacation and all that? How many of you don't want to be honest with me? <laughs> Or because you're Lutheran, you refuse to participate in questions in church? No. I love um, the, the one where the Griswolds go to Wally World. That's my absolute uh, favorite movie um, with the National Lampoons. And, and I love it because if you are a parent or, or an adult and have taken kids to Disney World or Disneyland or Knott's Berry Farms or whatever, uh, the trip there might be a very similar experience to the Griswolds, right? Uh, they go through a very tumultuous venture uh, to get to Wally World, and they finally come in the parking lot with what is left of their station wagon, and they are the only car there. And they start running towards the entrance in slow motion, right? And as soon as they get to the entrance, they are greeted by the mascot of Wally World, the moose. And the moose is holding a sign that says, sorry, folks, we're closed for two weeks. Clark, at that point, takes the opportunity to punch the moose in the face, showing his anger and frustration at the situation. And he does that because when good hopes become an ultimate hope, frustration, sadness, anger, depression all ensue. See, hope guides our life. Whatever we hope in or whatever we hope for changes the way we interact with our surroundings, changes the way we interact with others. And, and there's so much that we hope in, right? Let's talk about that for a second. We all here, whether we want to admit it or not, hope for money, especially in Southern California. We hope that we're going to have enough money to pay our rent, to pay our bills, and that's, that's not a bad thing. Some of us hope in, in politics like to joke that I have lived in each political, like, political opposite in our country, Tennessee and California. And I've listened to good Christian people say to me, like, Pastor, I'm so excited if so-and-so gets elected that they will lead America into the promised land. You know, I don't see that in Scripture. Maybe I'm reading the wrong Bible, but I don't see a politician leading us in, into the promised land. Some of us put our hope in our careers, what we do with our life. Many of us put our hope in relationships. We look towards our spouse or our partner as a, as a form of happiness to give us meaning in life. Or, or maybe if we're not married yet or we don't have someone, we're looking forward to that day when that person will give us some hope to keep going. Some of us hope in education. We think that good grades and more degrees are going to lead us to get the job that we want so we can make a lot of money and hopefully attract the spouse that we want. These are all of our hopes in life. Hope drives the way we do things. Now, none of these hopes are bad hopes. Don't hear me wrong. Jesus does not want you to be poor. He wants you to have enough money to pay your bills, to play a little bit, and to be generous. He wants you to, to become educated, whatever that means, so that you can climb up the corporate ladder and, and be in charge, because God wants good Christians in leadership. 
but he doesn't want you to sacrifice your family or your relationship with him in order to get there. And yet that's what we often do. We take a good hope and we make it an ultimate hope. We do the same thing in relationships. We put our hope in, in other people. We, we think that they're gonna bring us happiness and meaning, and when that doesn't happen, we end up absolutely broken. But we think that people are gonna give us what we need in life, and so we pressure them, and we choke them, and we smother them, and they run away. Because people make really, really bad gods. In fact, anything other than God makes a really bad God. We're in our 10th week. We, this, we are done after this in looking at the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed ends with this ultimate hope that, that I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. That is the ultimate hope we have as Christians, that all things are going to be made good once more. Notice how the Creed doesn't end by saying, I believe that money and education and politics and my career will get me to the point where I want to be in life. It doesn't end with that. It says, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, meaning that, that our ultimate hope as Christians is that Jesus Christ, having conquered death, having taken all of our sins to the cross because we couldn't, secured a place for us in paradise, and that all we need to do is to have faith in him. This is, this is what we believe as Christians. This is our ultimate hope, that eventually all these things in life that are causing us anxiety, frustration, depression, or anger, any of that stuff, is going to go away. And these bodies, these old bodies that maybe pop when you stand up, is going to be new. You're not going to have to use a walker anymore. You're not going to have to use a cane. You're not going to have to worry about your eyesight. It's all done. Everything is going to be perfect. But how often do we take our eyes off that ultimate hope? How often do we take the good hopes in our life and make them our ultimate hope? Let me share with you how I did that in my life. And just FYI, this is a very vulnerable moment. Um, some of you might think less of me after I share this, and frankly, that is on you. I'm not ashamed of this anymore. When I was 19 years old, I was uh, going to Concordia University in Nebraska, and I was living in the reality that people make really bad gods. I just didn't know that at the time. I was uh, uh, looking towards uh, both friendships and romantic relationships to give me some sort of meaning in life, to define who I was, to help me through the days. I was, I was looking towards good grades. Uh, which weren't coming as easily as they did in high school. I was looking to all these things that I shouldn't to be my ultimate hope, and it got to the point where eventually I couldn't see past today. I couldn't see that anything was going to get better in my life. And so one night at 19 years old, I decided that I was going to end my life. And I took a bunch of pills, and I went to sleep. Obviously, that didn't work. I'm here today. It did uh, result in a multi-day hospital stay for me, um, but thankfully, the by the grace of God, uh, I survived. For the last several years since that happened, I'm 28 years old now, for, for the last seven years after that, I never talked about it because I was ashamed of what I had done. I was ashamed of the point that I had reached, and I didn't want to tell people about it. But then this summer, I was asked to speak at the National Youth Gathering, where 22,000 youth come together from across the country on the topic of suicide. So I did. And I poured out my heart, and I shared my struggle. I shared how my ultimate hope had gotten mixed up. And I, I shared how still in my life now, I struggle with making good hopes into ultimate hopes, with, with, with taking my eyes off Jesus. And I shared that with them for the same reason that I'm sharing it with you, because good hopes will never take the place of your ultimate hope, and you will always end up at the end of yourself and at the end of your rope if you're letting those good hopes in your life become your ultimate hope. Here's what I've come to understand as I've talked with more people who have had suicidal thoughts or who have attempted suicide. 
It's that anyone who has thought about it, attempted it, or completed suicide, anyone in here who has just felt like they're at the end of the rope, anyone who's in here who, while they're driving down the road, sees a tree and thinks to themselves, I could make this look like an accident. I'm ready for the pain to be done. They're at that point in their life because they made a good hope into an ultimate hope. And listen when I say this, nothing, not money, not people, not education, can take the role of Jesus in your life. None of those things can give you everlasting life and happiness and hope. I wish that after that experience at 19 years old, my life would have immediately changed, but it didn't. Because continually, we make the same dumb mistakes that we do over and over and over again, right? But thank God, there's a church in Lincoln, Nebraska that, that I credit with uh, saving me from myself, and they reintroduced me to Jesus of Nazareth, a man who went to the cross to forgive my sins, to do what I couldn't do for myself, to rescue me from everything in this world and to lead me to life everlasting. This is my ultimate hope, is that Jesus is going to stay true to his promises and that all the things in my life that are causing me anger, frustration, depression, anxiety, whatever they are, that all those things are gonna come to an end eventually. I'm able to make it through the day because I have my eye on my ultimate hope not on the good hopes in my life, but on my ultimate hope, which is that God is going to make all things new. I love it in, in Revelation 21, if you wanna um, look this up in your own Bibles or on your phone or just mark it to read later, uh, Revelation 21 is a beautiful picture of heaven. Uh, Saint John is on the island of Patmos. He'd been exiled away and, and God gave him this revelation and this is what it says. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice say, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Do you see this beauty? Is that for so long we have existed without what I would say the physical presence of Jesus Christ in our everyday life, other than communion and the sacraments and all these things, but we've never seen God face to face. But on this last day, we get a picture of, of what Adam and Eve got to see in the Garden of Eden, that we will be united with God Almighty once more, our Creator, and He will dwell with us, and we will dwell with Him for eternity. And he goes on, and this is the part that always gets me, I just absolutely love it. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain for the older things have passed away. Man, I am looking forward to this day. I'm looking forward to all the things in my life that caused me pain and grief and heartache to be gone. I'm looking forward to the day when no one is crying because they have nothing to cry for anymore. I'm looking for the day when people are no longer mourning because they are with the people that they love. I'm looking forward to the day when I don't have to witness death anymore. This is my ultimate hope as a Christian, that Jesus is gonna make all things new, that everything is gonna be okay. And nothing can take the place of that ultimate hope in my life. So let me just recap this for you for a second. Is that we believe that because Jesus was raised from the dead, so we too, will be raised from the dead. We have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ and there's nothing that can take that away from us because it is a gift from God. When we believe in him, when we have faith in him, we have that gift that everything is gonna be all right and that we are gonna live with him in eternity. But eternity is the aspect of this we often forget. We forget that every person created by God is eternal. C.S. Lewis, the famous author, puts it this way in his, in his book, The Weight of Glory, and I love it so much that I wrote it in my Bible. He said, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. 
Nations, cultures, art, civilization, these are all mortal things. These are things that will go away. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Just take a quick look at the people around you real quick. Maybe that's awkward, okay? Just come on, participate, look at each other. These people aren't going anywhere. Everyone you're sitting next to is going to live on into eternity. And for some of you, you're like, gosh darn it, I really wish that wasn't true. <laughs> but the fact is, we, we believe that people are eternal, that everyone is eternal, and that people will either live in eternity with God in paradise or, or apart from God in a place that we call hell. And hell is very scary to think about, and it should be scary because it's not a place that we want anyone, even our worst enemy, to go. And so as we think about the resurrection of the body, as we think about eternity, I just have two questions that I really want to end with asking you. And the first one is this. Where's your ultimate hope right now? Is it in your career? Are you sacrificing time with your family, time with your spouse, time with your kids so that you can make more money to provide for them a better future? Listen when I say this, at your funeral, your kids are not gonna get up and talk about how much money you made. They don't care. They're gonna talk about how much you loved them. Is your ultimate hope right now the, the relationships that you have to where you have really uh, disregarded God and said that I'm going to get all of my hope, all of my happiness from this one person? That's not going to pan out. Is your ultimate hope sports for your kids? Maybe this is going to sound legalistic, but... But sports have become the new god in our culture, and we think that our kids are going are, are gonna to be some big-time um, baseball player or hockey player or whatever else. And so uh, we are okay with missing church. We're okay with not being a part of community because we want them to have a better life than we had, right? And they're going to play, uh, play in the big leagues. Your kid has a 0.02% chance of making it there. Are you okay with sacrificing the short time that you have with them in their house so that they can pursue sports, or do you want them to pursue the heart of God? What's your ultimate hope? If your ultimate hope is leaving you frustrated, sad, depressed, or anxious, that is a good hope that you've made into an ultimate hope. My second question is this. How are you doing in viewing the eternalness of your own soul and the soul of the people around you? How are you at looking at people as though they're going to be around here to stay? Do you turn away from the homeless person you see on the corner because you don't want to meet eyes with them? Do you talk down to the people in your life as though that they were, they were less than you? Do you treat your marriage like you do your dog? See, when we look at the reality that, that we go on living into eternity, that death does not end here, that changes the way we live because we have hope in the resurrection in this life everlasting. We want other people to know Jesus before they die. So uh, we are led to be more patient. And I hate being patient. It is not a spiritual gift that I have. But I'm called to that. We are led to, to use our words to, to build up life rather than take it away. We are led to want to cultivate the faith in our children, and not just our children, but the children of our neighbors, the children of our friends, and in our friends, because we have a short time to influence what God has entrusted to us. Use that 18 years wisely. We are led, as we look at the eternalness of our souls, to be different to treat our community different, to treat our friends different, to treat our enemies different. We cannot continue to fill our life with whatever the equivalent of ding-dongs and ho-hos is. We have got to get serious in thinking about the fact that eventually this life on earth will end, but that as we take our last breath here, we will take a new breath either in the presence of God or in the absence of God. We need to get serious about living 
a life where we see what our ultimate hope is day after day and we want other people to come to know the same Jesus that gives us our hope. And if you're wondering where that sustenance come from, what you need to fill your life with other than the ding-dongs and ho-hos, look no further than the cross of Jesus Christ where he died for you out of his great love. Jesus loves you, so do I. Amen.